people. So I am in the process of packing up my life as we speak. And um, I was looking through my DMs as well and I came across this DM. I'll leave it here. You can pause the screen now and read it quickly. I'll wait, don't worry. Are you done? Good. Everything you read in that DM is exactly what's been on my mind for the past two months, I would say. And also, it goes through my mind every time I leave Korea for home. So everything that she's mentioned in this DM, it's, it's absolutely true. It's definitely a very real thing. But also, if you're unfamiliar with what she's talking about, she's talking about a thing called, a phenomenon we'll call it, called reverse culture shock. If you're unfamiliar with what reverse culture shock is, Basically, uh, what happens is you're from a country with a certain culture, you go to a different country with a very different culture to yours, it becomes a culture shock because it's very different to your culture. And then what happens is you get used to that different culture, then you have to go back home to your culture, but because you're so used to that different culture, your own home culture becomes a shock to you. So it's like reverse culture shock. Do you get it? I actually made a video on this a few years ago but it was more for like a jokey style i'll leave it at the end you can go watch it but i decided today i will sit down very seriously and talk about this to you i'll talk about it more seriously today because it is actually a real thing that expats have to go through it's something that gets quite complex actually and it, it comes with a lot of difficulties um it just makes uh readapting to our home countries um, a very difficult thing most times and it often leads to a lot of sadness and a lot of stress actually uh, sometimes even depression anxiety yeah so I, I thought I would sit down and talk about it especially since we're at a time now it's the something of Feb I don't know we're at the end of Feb now basically and a lot of people are heading home along with me I really hope that I don't uh, scare anyone <laughs> going home uh, but we need to sometimes look at things uh, realistically. So what I'll do is I will talk about the four most common things I think that are uh, involved with reverse culture shock and the four most common things that make it so difficult to re-establish ourselves uh, back in our home countries. And um, I'm telling you now that I'm not ranking these things. That I don't think they can be ranked. They don't exist on some kind of hierarchy. They're all complex in their own ways. And I think that they just like coexist with one another. And they're all, they just all make your life a misery uh, in their uh, own ways. But the first thing I will talk about, uh, which makes reestablishing our lives back at home so difficult, we'll call it, we'll call it, inconvenience and inefficiency. I do love a bit of assonance. Before I get into this topic, I need you to know uh, that the expats who come to teach in Korea, I'm not talking about the ones who go to Thailand, Vietnam, all those countries. I'm talking about Korea now. The ones who come to Korea, they are always from one of seven countries, right? And out of all those countries, South Africa is the only country that is a developing nation, third world country. The rest are all first world developed nations. So I need you to know, because I feel like people don't actually realize this about South Africans, but actually we experience a double dose of culture shock. Because not only are we leaving our country with our culture and coming to Asia and experiencing Korean culture, which is so completely different to ours, but on top of that, we are leave we are coming to a country that is so super modern, and you know ours is so not. <laughs> so that in itself is another culture shock altogether. When when we get used to that lifestyle and go back to our lifestyle back at home, it's even more difficult for us. So I just need you to know that. That as a South African, in my humble opinion, we're dealing with a double dose of culture shock here. I'm not saying that the people from the States and the UK, for example, have a, a very easy transition when they go back home, but I do think that theirs is slightly easier than ours. And you will see why when I mention um, what I'm going to mention. So inconvenience and inefficiency. So basically, um, I don't think you will truly understand. No one will truly understand the true meaning of convenience 
and efficiency until they come to a country like Korea. I think I've mentioned this a million times in previous videos, but Korea is the definition for me of convenience and efficiency. You will only realize this when you leave a country like South Africa and come here. The, the problem is when you live in South Africa all your life, you don't realize just how inconvenient uh, a lot of the aspects of life are and how inefficient we are sometimes. It's almost like it becomes a part of our life. It becomes that South African way of life. We know it's frustrating, but we don't really realize just how frustrating it is until we leave and we come to a country like Korea and we experience what convenience and efficiency really is like then when we leave and then we go home that's when it really bites us so when I talk about inconvenience and inefficiency I'm talking about things like the pace of life in Korea the pace of life is so fast Korean people are quite impatient by nature and I think it has a lot to do with the with how fast the pace of life is here and uh, as someone who comes from a very uh, chilled, we'll call it chilled country <laughs> it was a huge shock to me when I got here and everything was like this whether you're in the subway, whether you're out on the streets walking to a shop whether you're packing groceries, it doesn't matter everything is like this, you better move your butt otherwise people are gonna get annoyed with you and the problem is I've lived here for so long now that I've become like that now now when I go home and I go to a shopping mall and people are like pushing their trolleys at 0.2 k's per hour I'm I'm just I just want to ram my trolley into their ankles I just don't, I don't understand why you're taking your time I understand that you're on a holiday but move it you know this, this, I've become like this now you will only really realize customer service when you get here you see th this is the difference between South Korea and South Africa uh, uh, and, and customer service in South Africa there's doing your job and then there's doing your job efficiently but don't expect them to come together as a package in South Africa in South Africa someone can do their job but whether they do it efficiently well that's a different story but in Korea doing your job and doing it efficiently one cannot exist without the other if you do your job you must do it efficiently otherwise you're seen as a failure one thing about Korean people is that their appearance is very important to them they're perfectionist by nature honestly and uh, if they're not doing their job well then they are so hard on themselves they they really beat themselves up and they failed in their eyes what about stuff like documents oh my gosh in South Africa uh, you always need like 507 documents for everything you just just oh my god <laughs> well you, you take like exchanging money just as one example I get it we're very unsafe in South Africa so we have to prepare all these documents for security reasons you take exchanging money in Korea you literally just take your passport you you're given your money in like 30 seconds I, I get the reason but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's frustrating it's time-consuming it's just <sighs> Yeah. What about internet? Korea has the fastest internet speeds in the world, right? And then South Africa, well, it doesn't. <laughs> of course, some of us live on a farm where we don't even have like uh, 4G internet. Some of us are still stuck with like minus 1G internet. But you know, I digress. Yeah, it just it makes life very difficult, especially when we're in the year 2021 and just as the years are going by internet becomes more fundamental in our lives but still South Africans are stuck with their slow internet and what's funny is um, we have slow internet okay it's not slow anymore but it's definitely much slower uh, and still very frustrating than you know Korean internet and um, what's really interesting to me is we we're stuck with this internet still and it's still so expensive so not only is our internet slow but it's still very expensive and I, I don't understand why we're still here why are we paying so much money for slow internet I don't know what about keeping to time whoa when something starts at 1 p.m. in Korea you best bet that it's starting 
at 1 p.m. The bus is leaving at 7.03. They're not just saying 7.03 and they mean that they're leaving at 7 p.m. roughly. No, they're literally leaving at 7.03. It means that you best hope that your butt is on that bus at 7.01 because at 7.02 they are closing the doors and at 7.03 the bus's wheels are turning and they're leaving you. They are so punctual here. They are more punctual than the most punctual clock here. I will never ever forget those days a hundred years ago when I was studying and I used to travel sometimes by bus from my tiny one horse town all the way to Grahamstown and the bus would leave at like 7 p.m. You think that means that the bus is leaving at 7 p.m.? Don't be ridiculous! They're just like giving you a vague general idea of when they will be leaving. Because at 7 p.m. people are still rocking up with their luggage, they're still taking like a register of all the people that should be on the bus at that time, they're still closing the boot of the, not the boot of the bus, the luggage compartments, they're still doing things at 7 p.m. So if you're lucky that bus is leaving at about half past seven to Gramstown. And also you just do a lot of waiting at home. I realized this when I got to Korea. You do a lot of waiting at home. I wonder how many hours in my life I've wasted just waiting and waiting. So all these things fall under the inconvenience and just inefficiency. When you become so used to these things in Korea, it makes going back home so much more difficult because you really do feel the pinch of these things when you go back home and you have to go back to that old way of living and that slow way of living. Let me tell you something, when I first came to Korea, I almost died. I was so shocked. It was so futuristic to me. Everything's just like machines and I, it, it was too, it, to say that I was overwhelmed, it would not even do justice to how I felt when I got to Korea. I'll never forget this one time. I was sitting next to my co-teacher and I was watching her and she was renewing her driver's license online. And she was laughing at me because I was just so... I was just shocked at what I was seeing. And like she was able to uh, take a photo of her thumbprint and they have this thing where you they scan the photo of your thumbprint and then everything's done. She was done in like a minute. She was done! renewing her drivers in like a minute and she was laughing at me do you know what she said to me she was like sam i really wish i can come to your country and see what you talk about and i was like no take that back be careful what you wish for okay number two uh and this one is needless to say my journalism lecturer would always say if it's needless to say then you don't need to say it no wrong Sometimes we have to say needless to say things just to emphasize a point. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. This needless to say thing that is very difficult to um, deal with when you go back home is crime. I don't think people truly realize the amount of stress that we are under daily in South Africa because of the crime. I don't think we realize how much tension that we constantly have on our shoulders the burden that we constantly have on our shoulders. Being alert all the time, constantly, every day, it is so stressful. It makes you so tense and you don't even realize that you're living with that amount of tension until you leave and come to a country like Korea. And then suddenly, it's gone. It's lifted off your shoulders. It's gone completely. And you actually feel lighter. Suddenly you realize that there's just a big chunk of stress gone. And only later you realize, oh, it's because I don't have to constantly be alert. And especially as a solo female and someone as small as myself as well, it's just the most liberating thing. When you no, no longer have to worry about walking alone anymore. I can literally, back in the day when I was uh, more social, I, I could literally come home at half past four in the morning from a night out. And of course, you know, sometimes your apartment in Korea, it's like down these little dark alleys. But I could go home down those dark alleys at half past four in the morning and I didn't even think that something would happen to me. I it, I had zero concerns. I'm not saying that Korea is 100% um, perfect and crime-free, but 
compared to my country it, it it basically is i can stop on the street at the red man and uh i'll have 10 other people standing right next to me also waiting for the green man and my bag will be open my phone will be in there my wallet which contains my entire life it'll be there it'll be open and i don't even have to look down because i know that no one's gonna touch it do you have any idea how liberating that is this one time in 2017 2018 my father got hijacked at home and i was at school and i was crying and i'm trying to explain to my co-teacher what was going on and why i was crying so i told her that my father got hijacked she didn't understand the term hijack so i explained the process of a hijacking to her so that she would understand what happened to him she still had no idea what a hijacking was and she could not believe that that kind of crime even existed she didn't know that it was possible for a person to stop you on the street and take your car when i was explaining the story to them they thought that that was something that was made up in movies and i was so shocked because that is one of the most common crimes in my country sorry so now why this is so difficult is when you're done being an expat and you decide to go back home Let's say you've been an expat for as long as I have, which is almost a decade. You've become so used to this crime-free life and this stress-free life. You suddenly have to go back to South Africa and immediately you've got, to, you've got to change your mindset back to South Africa. And you've got to start being a lot constantly again. All that stress comes back to you. It's almost like it never left you. Now let's not beat around the bush here, but South Africa has, if not the highest crime rate in the world, but one of the highest crime rates in the world. You all know it's true. So my nose is so stuffy, I'm sorry. The issue is that there are two extremes, two extreme ways of life, right? And because you've gone from basically no crime to so much crime that you are constantly alert again, that reality bites you so hard that it's just a shock to your system again. And so it's an incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult thing to do to transition back to when you're home and also you keep remembering what your life was like in korea and how carefree it was in korea that you often just sit and wonder like why why am i why have i chosen to deal with this again number three that we'll talk about is um uh, a very interesting one and that is not being able to connect with people anymore back at home this is a very sad one because it becomes so alienating so isolating so lonely i've just said the same thing in three different ways i don't know why i did that but you get the point let me explain my story so basically i graduated from university and immediately i jumped on a plane and went to korea not only did i do that but i went on to spend many years in korea what happens is when you go back home and let's say you've spent a lot of time in a different country like me usually people who spend more than three years in a different country it affects them more what happens is when you decide to go back home and you try to maintain meaningful meaningful very noisily today i'm sorry um you'll find that it's very difficult to maintain meaningful relationships back at home and that's because you've lived a very different life to the people back at home so when you try to have meaningful conversations with them again after all these years that you've spent in a different country it becomes very very difficult because here's the thing you can go back home and you can have conversations with your friends again right and it's all fun and games because you're swapping different stories so they're telling you stories about their life back at home and you're telling them stories about your life in korea or wherever it's all very interesting but unfortunately, that can only take you so far in a conversation. You end up reaching a point in a conversation where now you need to connect. But nothing's connecting you because that person has never left home and you've only been away from home. So you can't connect. Now what ends up happening, in my case anyway, what ends up happening is I can still relate and connect to that person because at the end of the day, I'm still South African and I still understand and relate to their stories as a South African. 
But what happens in their case is because they've never experienced Korea, they can't fully relate to what I'm talking about. They can never fully understand my experiences because they've never experienced that Korean or that expat life. So all the things that I'm telling them, they're like interesting stories to them, but they can't connect to me because they will never truly understand my experiences. And so my stories to them, temporarily, they're very, they're interesting. But that's all they'll be. They'll just be like little interesting anecdotes. The other problem is sometimes when I go back home and I talk to people, sometimes I feel self-conscious about talking about Korea or just my life in general because sometimes it comes across as I'm, I'm worried that the other person thinks that I'm showing off because I lived in Korea and I did all these things. In all honesty, that's my life experience. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's all I have to talk about. Think about my example. I literally went from university to Korea. I left South Africa at a very crucial point in my life. I left South Africa when my life started. Before I graduated, I didn't really have a life. My life was just studying and being with my parents. When I left university and went to Korea, that's when my life truly started. That's when I did things without my parents. And that's when I had a job. And that's when I paid my own bills. And that's when I made my own food. And that's when I lived my own experiences. And that's when I was 22 and I'm now almost 32. So from that moment when I left South Africa to now, Korea is literally all I know. So when I have conversations with people and when I have to reference things in my life and draw on memories and draw on experiences, I can only truly draw it from my life in Korea. Because if I'm 32 now, how can I possibly talk about life before Korea? Because life before Korea was just studying. It was literally just primary school, high school, university. It was just academics. So how could I possibly... I'm too far removed from that now at 32 to talk about that. At that point of my life is irrelevant now. The problem with this now is I find, I'm talking for myself now, I find that the only people who I can truly talk to and the people I can truly have meaningful conversations with and meaningful relationships with are people who are currently expats or people who are ex-expats because they are the only people who truly understand what I've been through. We've had the same experiences and so we can connect. Yes. That's quite a sad one, isn't it? This is the thing. What I'm telling you in this video, it's not going to be exactly the same for every expat. Please remember that. P expats come here at different points in their life. They come here for a different duration of time. This situation that I've talked about now, it's going to be very different for a person who comes here at the age of 27, for example, because that does happen. Someone who comes here at 27, for example, they've already experienced life in South Africa until they were 27. That's a very long time to have a job and a, um, a, a life in South Africa. And then they come to Korea for maybe a year or two and then they go back. And it's a lot easier for those people to transition, to retransition into South African society. The last one I'll talk about is going back home after your expat life and going back into your field. <laughs> now forget the fact that the job market at home is a bit cuck. We already know that the job market at home is just getting, uh, well, it's getting smaller and smaller as the years go by. Uh, and you know, for what the heck was that? And now, of course, things are even worse with the pandemic. But anyway, a lot of the people who come and teach English in Korea and all the other countries as well, quite often you will find that these people are not qualified teachers. So we have degrees in other fields, but we're not qualified teachers. I've met people here from all walks of life. I mean, I'm a journalist. I've met lawyers, I've met people in business, I've met people in the medical field, I've met accountants. A lot of the time people are here, not just South Africans, Americans too, because they couldn't find a job at home. So what do they do? They come to Korea to teach English because they can't find a job at home. Now what happens? They stay here for about three years, but they now after three years they want to go home. Now they've lost out on three years of experience in their field. I just, I thought I saw my battery flashing. I was about to throw this camera out the window. So obviously now when they go back home, it's very difficult to find a job again because they've been away from their country and their field for such a long time. So what happens? They end up becoming very frustrated and very desperate 
and so they come back to Korea. Oh, what happens as well is I've also noticed this is sometimes people will go home and they'll get a job, but they're miserable. You know why? Because they can no longer do that nine to five office job. You know why? Because this life teaching English as a second language in Korea, it spoils them. Teaching is stressful, yes, but you know, this job, it's quite fun. While your office job back at home is like this, teaching English in Korea, it's like this. It's very dynamic. You know why? Because you're teaching about 30 kids a day. Every day is different because the kids are bringing in different experiences every single day. So without fail, you're going to have a unique day. On top of that, you're earning very well to do the amount of work that you do and you get to travel. So this life, it spoils you. It's very difficult to leave this life and go back to your nine to five office job back at home because you're very spoiled here. So sometimes whether you don't get a job or whether you do get a job back at home, people end up coming back. Of course, people end up staying and they are quite happy to uh, resettle. But a lot of the times people come back. It's really, really hard because sometimes when you're doing something like this when it's not the thing that you studied. You really feel inadequate sometimes because there's often this uh, idea that, you know, when you're teaching English in Korea or whichever other country, you're often seen as like bumming about in Asia. And this used to trouble me a lot in the past because, you know, I wasn't doing journalistic things and I wasn't living a normal settled life back at home. And it almost felt like I was just forever being uh, like an irresponsible person bumming about in Asia and just having fun and not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But then after a while, I realized you know, why am I even worrying about this? Sometimes we have to ask ourselves what we truly want and what truly makes us happy. It might not be a career, but at least I have a job. And at least I have a job that pays me well. And at least I still get to travel and have fun at the same time. And if that's making me happy, then why the heck not? At the end of the day, right, we need to earn money and survive this horrible capitalist world. So does it really matter at the end of the day how the money is coming in? As long as I'm happy and I'm satisfied, right? So if I'm not getting that at home, then why am I so under pressure to return home to a normal life? I don't know. These are the dilemmas that we have to deal with. So those are the four main things that I can think about which contribute to this reverse culture shock and which make it so difficult for a lot of expats to uh, deal with when they return to their home countries. I realize that other expats from other countries may only have to deal with some of these things, but definitely as a South African, we have to deal with all four of these things and at the same time. And that's what makes it so incredibly difficult. And often we go home and we get really sad and it gives us a lot of anxiety having to deal with all of these things at the same time. Which is why you will often see a lot of us going back. Because we go home and we feel so isolated, so alienated. Sometimes it feels like we're stuck in limbo. And uh, we just feel like social outcasts in our own country. And so what happens is we end up going back. To Korea. We're still going to be outcasts in that country, but at least we're outcasts with other people who also feel like outcasts. <laughs> and sometimes, a lot of the times actually, we'll find that people back at home, they don't really understand what we're going through. And you'll get a lot of people, you know, saying things like, well, if you were so happy in Korea, why didn't you just stay there? Why, do you, why are you coming back to South Africa and complaining about South Africa? But here's the thing, right? Sometimes people back at home, they don't understand that you're allowed to be proudly South African but also be angry and disappointed at the same time. Like you can be all three of those things at the same time and people don't understand that. But no, I'm allowed to be proudly South African and I can still be brave enough to stand up and say, you know what, this 
standard of living that I'm getting at home. It's not right. Why do I have to live like this? Yeah, so please don't get me wrong. Obviously, I'm proudly, I'm so proud to be South African and I love my country. And a lot of the times we fall into this trap. We sometimes, and I've been guilty of this in the past where we say like, even with all our flaws, I still love my country. Actually, we need to say that, yeah, I love my country and yeah, I'm proud to be South African, but uh, all these things which contribute to our standard of living, they're not right and we shouldn't be living like this. I also want you to remember that you're going home and you think that everything's gonna be fine because it's home but it's n just it's never as easy as that. The truth of the matter is you become so used to this new culture that your whole lifestyle it influences your mindset it just changes everything for you and you must also remember that even if you just spend one year in korea you change so much in that one year you grow so much with that growth in yourself like comes a change in your values and what uh happiness means to you of <laughs> all of those cringy things your ideas about you know what life should be like for yourself and what you expect uh in terms of a standard of living it's it all changes and a lot of it is influenced by what you've experienced in just that one year in korea whether it's one year whether it's 10 all of that plays a part in how you transition back at home and it it makes it more difficult to resettle because you now have a different idea of how you want your life to be and what your life should be like and because you've you you your eyes have been opened to a different way of living you're now juggling those ideas with the ones that was your normal and uh yeah so all these complications i need you to know that if you're an expat and you're watching this and you're heading home for the first time it's not going to be easy but you'll, you'll get there in the end everything will be okay at the end i promise with that being said i'm so excited to go home next month <laughs> anyway this was a very heavy video and i'm sorry <laughs> but actually i'm not sorry you know sometimes i'm allowed to make heavy videos <laughs> it's my channel i can do what i want to all right uh if if you are an expat and you're watching this please let me know your opinions let me know if you went back home and transitioned well or let me know if you are like me and tried to go home and came back multiple times <laughs> don't forget if you like the video give it a like if you didn't like the video give it a like anyway don't forget to follow me on all the social medias and don't forget to subscribe to my channel don't forget to join my channel and i will see you very soon with a new video goodbye Thank you.